Below me lies Aspen, one of the richest small towns in America. Home to billionaires, millionaires and movie stars, the winter playground for the very lucky 1%. And the life of every high society party was a famously wild woman named Nancy Pfister. The peace and tranquility of beautiful Aspen, Colorado is suddenly shattered by the gruesome murder of the town's favourite daughter. A celebrated high society party girl whose notorious life of free love, designer drugs and champagne breakfasts reportedly included romances with the likes of Jack Nicholson and Michael Douglas. Nancy would find them all. She'd find the ones that were hiding and she'd find the ones that wanted the publicity. And the hunt for the murderer of Nancy Pfister would become such a tangled legal fiasco of flimsy evidence and multiple arrests that nobody really knows for sure just who is the killer. I think that that's immoral. And I think that it's maybe borderline criminal. <laughs> But now, a Crime Watch Daily investigation has uncovered new bombshell evidence that could finally lay to rest a sensational murder mystery that has simply refused to die. A chilling confession from the grave that's so detailed in its graphic blow-by-blow -blow description of the murder of Nancy Pfister that it leaves little doubt that it's true. She grew up entitled, she grew up spoiled, and she lived her life as she should have, entitled and spoiled. Like a princess, according to Nancy's close pal of 40 years, Bob Browdus, a former Aspen sheriff, art dealer, and local cultural icon who is thought of as the unofficial mayor. She definitely was born into royalty here in our little town. Nancy's father, Art, was one of the men who helped build Aspen back in the 60s. A moneyed landowner who was the king of Buttermilk Mountain, turning it into one of the town's first and most elite ski resorts for the rich and famous. Her father and mother were very, very well known in the whole community. They started Aspen. And Nancy became the queen of the hill a social butterfly who made partying her career. When she walked into a dull party, you knew the evening was gonna become more interesting. How wild was Nancy Pfister? I've heard she was very wild. Um, she had different men that she slept with in her own home, you know, maybe once a week. And sometimes more than one at a time, according to Daylene Berry, author of the book Guilt by Matrimony, which chronicles Nancy's murder. She would have group sex or just couples having sex together in the same room. But Berry says Nancy needed a little help from her friends. She would get up in the morning and she would be drunk by noon because she would start drinking her favorite champagne. She would take handfuls of pills. She would do that every single day. This is the famous J Bar here in Main Street in Aspen. It really was one of Nancy's favourite watering holes where she had many adventures with her famous friends, including the notorious party animal Hunter S. Thompson. In fact, one of the bartenders in here just told me that one night she even accidentally set herself on fire. But this party at Nancy's own home on Buttermilk Mountain would be like no other bash Nancy had ever thrown or attended. It was a farewell soiree for the social queen of Aspen before she was to fly south for the winter to an Australian summer. But this farewell would be far more permanent than any could have imagined. Little did we know that was the last time any of us were ever going to see her alive again. The blue blood heiress of one of Aspen's founding families would be discovered beaten to death with a hammer. 57-year-old's lifeless body stuffed in her bedroom closet, leaving residents of this exclusive Rocky Mountain hamlet in a state of fear. It's just inconceivable to think that somebody like that would be bludgeoned in such a, an awful way. Oh my God! Oh my God! 
Hold on, ma'am. I need you to take a deep breath. Jet Set socialite Nancy Pfister was murdered just days after returning to Aspen from a three-month getaway to sunny Australia. She had texted me an hour before she was murdered, basically saying that jet lag had crippled her and she was finally getting to sleep. But Nancy would never wake up. You then would have been one of the last people to communicate with Nancy. Yes, that was her last living act as far as they could discover doing a timeline of the crime. While many loved Nancy and found amusement in her wild life of sex, drugs and fun parties, there were also those who were not so fond of her, especially other women. Nancy would sit on your lap right in front of your wife and she did that repeatedly and got away with it at the cost of losing a lot of female friends. One of the women police considered a suspect in Nancy's murder was Kathy Carpenter, who acted as Nancy's assistant, and they reportedly bumped heads frequently. The relationship with uh, Kathy Carpenter was very stormy. Kathy Carpenter and Nancy Pfister were like husband and wife. They constantly relied on each other. There was some talks of how Nancy Pfister treated Kathy, and at some points it wasn't very nice. There were some disputes that they had, and so there was some concern on our part that she had possibly been involved in the murder. Another woman considered a suspect in Nancy Pfister's murder was Nancy Styler, along with her retired doctor husband, William, better known as Trey. The three had been locked in a bitter money dispute. So it was no secret that there was a great deal of animosity between the Stylers and Nancy Pfister. Trey and Nancy, a noted horticulturalist, had only recently arrived in Aspen from Denver, hoping to start a new life after losing just about everything they owned from bad investments. You're in this situation where life is perfect and then all of a sudden one little thing happens. The Stylers decided to use what little cash they had left to start a Botox and laser spa in Aspen. New to town and full of optimism about their fresh start, the Stylers answered an ad in the Aspen Times that led them here to the base of Buttermilk Mountain and a fork in the road. In hindsight, they took the wrong turn. Driving up West Buttermilk Road to Nancy Fister's home, which she was trying to rent for the time she would be in Australia. Locked upstairs and we're greeted by Nancy in a white, like hotel bathrobe, a strand of pearls, a glass of pink champagne, and nothing else. The stylers immediately agreed to rent the three bedroom, three bath chalet for $12,000 for three months. And Nancy Fister threw in a bonus. The stylers could stay there with her for free for a month before she left for Australia, and even start up their spa there in return for helping her pack and prepare for the trip. And I thought, this is great. But it wasn't just helping Nancy Fister pack. The minute I gave her the money, I became a slave. And Fister would parade around naked in front of Trey. It would have made a lot of people jealous. Of her? Sorry. I, I, I was not jealous of, of her. So the stylers breathed a big sigh of relief when Nancy Fister finally left for Australia and they had the house to themselves. And I was thrilled when I heard she was in Australia. But their joy would be short-lived. Nancy Fister accused them in a series of emails of damaging the property and not paying utilities, threatening to sue them for $14,000 and giving them four days' notice to vacate the house before she returned early from Australia. We did our best to try and get out of there then moved into a nearby motel. And days after Nancy Fister returns to Aspen, she's found dead. Oh my God, my, my bed, I got my bed in the closet. Nancy Fister had been laying low and trying to sleep off jet lag after returning to Aspen from Australia. But when her assistant, Kathy Carpenter, hasn't seen or heard from her boss for three days, 
she goes to the socialite's house to check on her. There's no sign of Nancy anywhere. Just a rancid smell coming from the bedroom closet. And when Kathy opens the closet door, Kathy is hysterical in her call to 911. My, my friend, I got my friend in the closet. Ma'am, I need you to take a deep breath so that I can send you help. I need you to tell me exactly what happened. I got my friend in the closet. And those very words immediately make Kathy Carpenter a suspected murderer. The odd thing was there was no way she could have seen that it was Nancy Pfister. When you went into the closet and you saw what was in there, it looked like a pile of laundry. Nancy Pfister's body had been completely wrapped in sheets. Unless you pulled back the sheets and actually looked at what was there, you did not know that it was a person. She insisted that she saw this while insisting that she had not touched any of the sheets. She had not moved anything. She had not pulled it back. Making Kathy look more guilty, cops learned she had taken $6,000 and two valuable rings from Nancy Fister's safety deposit box the very next day. Kathy Carpenter had access to it. She had the key and she could definitely go in and out of it. But to empty out that box, was very, very strange. I don't think of that as something you would do after you find that your friend is dead, to take those valuables and secret them. What was the motive you believed at the time, for example, with Kathy? It was odd. Was she somehow taking money from Nancy Pfister? Or did she get caught up in the animosity? Kathy Carpenter had already pointed the finger at Trey and Nancy Styler in her 911 call. My, my friend came back from Australia and she had some people living there and um, she made threats to them about owing money. And she elaborates during her police interrogation. There was bad blood between them. At 5.30 in the morning, police turn up at the door of the Styler's motel room. I truly thought that I was dreaming. And one of the guys said, no, there's a dead body. And I said, what, who? And it will be learned Nancy Styler had actually threatened to kill Nancy Pfister. I did say that. Now, Trey and Nancy Styler have both been taken in for questioning. But Trey, at age 65, frail and suffering from a debilitating neurological disease, didn't seem strong enough to commit the crime, at least on his own. To pack her body into trash bags, wrap it in sheets, drag it to the bedroom closet, and then flip her mattress over to hide the bloodstains. Is that something that you accepted that he was physically capable of? Not at the time. Carrying a dead body, even if you drag it into the closet, it's not an easy job for one person. Flipping a queen mattress from one side to the other, doable, because I've done it myself, uh, for him to do that by himself would have been very difficult. Of more interest to cops was Nancy Styler, whose animosity towards Fister was no secret. And just as Fister's assistant, Kathy Carpenter, had pointed the finger at the Stylers, Nancy Styler was now pointing her finger back at her for the Fister murder. I thought that she and Kathy had a major fight. And I thought that Kathy had gotten drunk, blacked out, killed her. But Kathy had never threatened to kill Fister. On the other hand, Nancy Styler had. What was the motive there? Nancy Styler had made some comments to the effect that she would rather see Nancy Fister dead. She'd expressly said she would like to kill her. There was motivation there, for sure, just like her husband, Trey. And Nancy, surprisingly, denies none of it when I ask her about her hatred for Fister. 
on reflection, one of the interrogators looked back and said, the most striking thing from the interview with, with Nancy, with yourself, was this overwhelming hatred, as they described it, that you had for the victim, for Nancy. I think that I was very honest with them when they said to me, did you like her? And I said, no, I hated her. You said more than that. You said she's a liar, she's an alcoholic. She disrespected me like no other person has ever done. And that was all honest. What was I supposed to say? No, I never said that. I did say it. But that doesn't mean I was going to kill her. Without enough evidence to link them to the murder, the stylists are released after 12 hours of questioning, but remain under heavy suspicion, as does Kathy Carpenter. We're looking at all three. That's our job. We've got to look at all three. Police don't know if one of them did it alone, if another had helped, or if they had all done it together. These three people might have been bonded together by their hatred for Nancy. Yeah, they could have definitely developed a bond through this animosity. Then a huge discovery. A trash collector empties out a garbage can just 100 yards from the Stylers Motel and finds personal items belonging to Nancy Fister and an old hammer with Nancy Fister's blood on it. And on one of the plastic bags is Trey Styler's DNA. It broke the case. And Nancy Fister's blood is found in the trunk of the Styler's car. That was also a big piece of evidence. But there was still more to be uncovered. The key to the bedroom closet where Nancy Fister's body was found. Amazingly, the key was ultimately found outside of the door of their hotel room in Basalt. Nancy Styler's defense attorney, Garth McCarty, suspects all the evidence may have been planted. I think everybody, including law enforcement, was a little suspicious at first that it was actually just found by chance. Police arrest Trey and Nancy Styler and charge them with first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. And 11 days later, they arrest Kathy Carpenter on the same charges. The Stylers and Carpenter sit behind bars for three months before they turn up in handcuffs for their first court appearance. It was one of the most anticipated trials in Aspen legal history. The courtroom's packed and those who couldn't get in had gathered outside, all waiting to see what would happen in the sensational case of three people charged over the one murder. Then inside, the bombshell dropped. In a written affidavit, Trey Styler has confessed to murdering Nancy Fister on his own without the knowledge or help of his wife Nancy or Kathy Carpenter, who both emerged from court free women. I mean, I'm hysterical. I'm wondering, did he do anything here or is he just falling on his sword? A lot of other people in Aspen are still asking the exact same question and more. I would say there's a very strong, pervasive opinion among those who are familiar with the case that Nancy Styler beat a murder rap. But nobody saw this next bombshell coming. Another secret confession uncovered by Crime Watch Daily, graphically detailing the savage slaying of Nancy Fister. It was bang. What do we do now? Trey Styler's bombshell confession should have put an end to the mystery of Nancy Fister's death. So, how come so many people here in Aspen are still convinced someone got away with murder? Do you actually believe Trey's confession? I believe most of it. Again, I question whether he did the cleanup alone, but I don't have anything to say he didn't. But at least the police had their killer and the two women charged along with him, his wife Nancy and Fister's assistant, Kathy Carpenter, had been set free. But former sheriff Bob Browdus is among those who still thinks Nancy Styler got away with murder. I do believe that Nancy Styler was with Dr. Styler when Nancy Fister was murdered. Browdus bases his suspicions on evidence that Nancy Styler's cell phone was emitting signals from Nancy Fister's home at the same time Trey Styler said he was there murdering the socialite. 
Dr. Styler explained it away by saying he had taken his sleeping wife's phone on the morning of the killing because his own phone had a low battery. I can't see Dr. Styler leaving his wife in a motel room 20 miles away and taking her phone with him. But District Attorney Sherry Kaloya says she couldn't disprove Dr. Styler's story about the phone and therefore prove his wife was there with him. I always will question whether he cleaned up the site after the murder himself, but I do believe he committed the murder by himself. And any hope of getting more answers from Trey Styler appeared to literally die, along with him, when he committed suicide by hanging himself in his jail cell just this past August. But now, Crime Watch Daily has uncovered a bombshell piece of evidence only a scarce few knew even existed. The first book, I can't say that I was giving any great thought to what I was doing or how I was doing it. A second confession he made in prison just months before he killed himself. I mean, there's part of me that can't believe I did it. Unlike his original confession, which was made in a written affidavit, this new confession is a chilling eight-hour-long video that shows Dr. Styler giving a gruesome play-by-play -play of the murder that could finally erase all doubts about his guilt and whether he had accomplices. Nancy and Will would both be better off believing things were as they seemed. The anatomy of a murder. I struck the first blow in the back of her head because that was what was available. Coldly chronicled in gruesome clinical detail by the mad doctor who beat Aspen socialite Nancy Fister to death with a hammer. It wasn't bang, 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 bang. It was bang. Oh, and what do I do now? His dying confession captured in a chilling eight hour interview just months before he would hang himself in his jail cell. Then my training was kicking in, and it was like, OK, let's make sure that she doesn't awaken in the moments that remain to her. The confession uncovered exclusively by a Crime Watch Daily investigation that may finally lay to rest a sensational murder mystery that has simply refused to die. Dr. Trey Styler had previously confessed to police that he murdered Nancy Fister, but only in an affidavit that many doubted was true, suspecting he was taking the rap to free his wife, Nancy, who had been jailed along with him on first-degree murder charges. And if he continued to try to deny that he did it, he knew he wasn't going to help Nancy. But Dr. Styler agreed to do this second video confession with Daleen Berry, author of a book about the case titled Guilt by Matrimony, in the hope that it would end persistent suspicions that Nancy had something to do with the crime. He said, I need to tell the truth for Nancy. I need to do that because she deserves for me to do that. And so the least I can do is come clean on this. And Nancy Styler would sit at my side to watch her late husband's final testament. So Nancy, what I'm about to show you, this is going to be the first time that you've seen this video. So this is going to be a difficult thing for you to watch. Uh, it's going to be very emotional material. And I want you to know that if it becomes overwhelming at any point, we can pause. OK, we're going to watch it now. God, I wish it never happened. It did. Nancy is immediately taken aback by how Trey's physical appearance has deteriorated since she last saw him. I mean, he doesn't look like himself. He's got the long beard, the hair is long. Looks totally different, sounds totally different. Trey remembers leaving his wife asleep in their motel room while he goes to confront Nancy Fister over their eviction from her house, her demands for $14,000 in utility costs and property damage, and her refusal to let them retrieve beauty spa equipment they'd left in her basement. I remember going there with the intention of talking to her. I was angry with her and intended to challenge her and to 
demand that she retract her demands for more money. I intended to confront her and to demand that she back down. When he arrives at the Fister home, Trey knocks on the door, gets no response, and notices the door is unlocked. I remember calling her name, coming in and finding her blissfully asleep. Trey begins to talk to Fister, but can't wake her up. I think there was part of me that was thinking that she was playing asleep, that she was just not responding. I've been told since that time that she had earplugs in. That's why she didn't hear me. I didn't know that at the time. And Nancy Fister's silence sends him into a blind rage. She was sleeping peacefully while my life was going down the tubes. The next thing I knew, it had been done. He'd hit Nancy Fister in the head with a hammer he found in her house. I struck the first blow in the back of her head because that was what was available. Since she did not react to that, took her from sleep straight to unconsciousness. Dr. Styler takes Fister's pulse and realizes she's not dead. It wasn't bang, 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 bang. It was bang. And what do I do now? And then it probably took a couple of minutes before I thought I'd just make sure I hit her in the two frontal lobes. Kind of more on top. Okay. Um, because I knew that that would preclude any consciousness. Can I just stop it? Just stop it there, Nancy. We initially wanted to explain this as a way as this, you know, this was a man who snapped. Mm -hmm. But I mean, now we're talking about medical training, the, the location of the blows, a man who took her pulse after the first blow. The doctor in him is coming out and being analytical after he's just lost his mind. Trey grabs an extension cord as he plans what to do with Nancy Fister's body. I wanted to contain her and the blood so that she didn't bleed on the things and I grabbed some big trash bags, pulled one over her head, I was gonna put the other one over her feet. I used that extension cord to kind of hold her up like this. I rolled the body onto a sheet, pulled her off of the bed under the floor, and then dragged the sheet, basically. The sheet there, okay. the sheet there. Grabbed the foot of the sheet, so to speak, back up, pulled it to me. Well, it took about, I mean, it was only about 10 feet. Can I just pause it there as well? I mean, that, that's, it's so difficult to watch. It's so hard to look at. And, and I guess this goes to the heart of your implication in all of this, right? This rumor and this innuendo and supposition. I mean, we're looking at him now. This is a guy in a wheelchair. He certainly doesn't look in top physical condition. You knew him better than anyone. He, he was able to do it on his own. Well, he did, yeah. And you look at the laws of physics, you can drag a bunch of weight rather than lift it. And it surprises me that law enforcement didn't look at it that way. I mean, it's, it's pretty chilling, isn't it, to see him? Oh my God, it's horrible. Then he stuffs the wrapped body of Nancy Fister in her bedroom closet. I mean, There's part of me that can't believe I did do it. And he insists his wife had nothing to do with the murder. One thing I know beyond doubt is that Nancy not only had no involvement in it, she had no knowledge of it. But many still have their doubts about that, suspecting Trey was covering for the woman he loved so much that here he breaks down recalling their early courtship. When I returned home that night, my mother was... <coughs> I told her I'd met the woman I didn't marry. Could just pause it there? I mean, you can tell you were everything to him. Hmm. Not enough. Not enough. What do you mean by not enough? Not enough to keep him alive. Not enough to make him want to live. But enough for him to make a false confession just to get her off the hook? What do you say to the people of Aspen who continue to cast doubts? 
I'm seeing progress. I'm seeing people who didn't even want to look at me, who were afraid to have their children next to me, are now saying, how could we believe that of you? And there's going to be some people who don't believe me ever. And what can I say to them? I take Nancy Styler back to the scene of the crime, the mountain home where her husband confessed he murdered Nancy Pfister. When Trey came here mm -hmm. and he drove down this driveway towards this place, mm -hmm. do you think he had murder on his mind? Oh my God, no. No, he was coming to talk to her. He didn't have murder on his mind. I asked him that over and over again and he's reassured me that he was just coming to talk. Instead, he beat the socialite to death with a hammer in a moment of madness that robbed Aspen of a celebrated member of one of its most prominent families. The family was this mountain, and I hate to see this black spot on the mountain. Despite her husband's confession, many in Aspen still suspect Nancy Styler had something to do with leaving that black spot here and I would confront her point blank with those persistent suspicions in a blunt sit-down interview. I want to ask you some difficult questions. Absolutely. No lies, no half-truths, no self-preservation. Absolutely. Did you kill Nancy Pfister? Nothing to do with it. You Did had I nothing know? to do with the murder whatsoever? Nothing. You weren't there in the moments after she was killed? It was you, 20 miles away. You weren't there to help clean up the scene or to move the body? No, and I would have done a better job. The job that was done was not a thinking mind. And you can look me in the eye now and say that even after the fact, accepting that you weren't there at the time of the murder, you had no knowledge whatsoever of your husband's actions before or after that murder. You Absolutely. just simply didn't know. Wasn't even in my thought process. Didn't even consider it. Phone records showed, of course, that your cell phone was there at the time. Right. That was a decision that your husband mysteriously took just to take your phone to the crime scene. Because his was out of batteries and he was trying to let me sleep. This isn't the first time he's done it. So, Nancy, this was simply a case of guilt by association, guilt by matrimony, as it's been described. Mm -hmm. I mean, this entire case that was built by the investigators, by the detectives, by the prosecution, all of it was bungled, all of it was false. Correct. There are many people in this town, some of them high ranking, that still believe you either got away with murder yourself mm -hmm. or you got away with being an accessory to murder. Mm -hmm. If indeed you were concealing a dark secret of that magnitude, mm -hmm. it would be an enormous and permanent burden for you, I imagine. Oh my God, no, I can't even imagine it. To the events of that night, mm -hmm. do they still play over in your mind? Absolutely. And I made him go over it and over it and over it for me. I made him tell me, because I couldn't believe it. You made him tell you the gruesome, unbearable I detail. made him tell me everything. How long was it before she didn't have a pulse? I wanted to know everything because Why? I... Why did you want to know that? Because I didn't believe it. I didn't believe it. I thought that he was still saying this just so I could go free. I couldn't believe this. I needed to know, what did you do with this? Why did you do this? When you heard that he had killed himself? I was happy, because he's at peace. He was tormented. Can you imagine a gentleman knowing what he did to that woman, her family, and his own family, what he did to me? to take my life and switch it, you know, throw it all away. He was thinking he could get away with it and we could go on and live our lives. And I can't imagine that man, even if he got away with it, I can't imagine him living with that. He was a gentle man. It would have destroyed him. If you did get a chance to talk to him now, what would you say? That I love him and I forgive him. And I wish that I could have gotten more help for him. And I wish that people like Nancy Pfister would get more help. It's not one person that causes all of this. You know, it's, it's personalities and, and illnesses that are one on top of another. I've got to disagree with you, Nancy. 
they would mm -hmm. say to you, it absolutely was one person who took a hammer and ended her life. Absolutely. But it's not one person who, there's more to it there. You can't take a person and, and put it for their one minute, that one minute deed that my husband did, that awful moment there. You can't judge his whole life by that, and he didn't do it unprovoked. And no one deserves to die that way. I don't care if they're the devil. But you're saying there may have been part of her that contributed to it? I would say that yes. Everyone contributed a little bit. Part of Nancy's actions that led to her getting bludgeoned to death Abs that night? Absolutely. That would be enormously hurtful for her family to hear. It's, it's the truth. Are you saying that if Nancy had been any other person and never did anything, she wouldn't be in the position that she's in. I'm not saying anything she did made her deserve to die, but I'm saying that it did fuel the fire. If she hadn't fueled the fire with him or anyone else, because there were a lot of other people that were upset with her actions, that she wouldn't be in that position. But there are people fueling the fire, as you call it, all around America every day. Every day. And the response to that is not to take a hammer He's and... He's absolutely wrong, absolutely sick, absolutely mentally ill. That's not the product of a working mind. No, I'm not saying that what he did was right. It's absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong. Nancy Styler has left Aspen, but whether she will ever be completely absolved of having anything to do with Nancy Fister's murder is a question only time will answer. One more footnote on this story. Nancy Fister's assistant, Kathy Carpenter, has since moved out of Aspen. Now, she continues to maintain she had nothing at all to do with Nancy's death. We reached out to her for comment on our story but our calls were not returned.